we're going to go ahead and start with our next panel. And I would like to invite um, Missy Whiteman to come up. And her family is going to be sharing with us. And so I'd like to invite Missy to come up um, to do an introduction of the short film that we'll be seeing. And then we get to hang out with her family and have another chat with family and friends. Dos, my name is Missy Whiteman. I belong to the Northern Arapaho and Kickapoo Nations. Um, I'm a filmmaker, writer, director, producer, artist, um, daughter, mother to Lewis and Molly. And also, um, I want to introduce this video. This is called The Great Race, and it's produced by the Garden Warriors of Dream Wild Health. I'd like to acknowledge Diane Wilson and everyone else from Dream Wild Health family. They're here. Round of applause. So the youth produced this video. Um, it was about over a year. We started in the springtime, and they wanted to do an adaptation of The Great Race and The Tortoise and Hare. So they wrote the script, they storyboarded, and then in the spring, they did casting, which meant their friends come and dressed them up. And um, there's also a little tutorial on how to do a smoothie. So that one will probably need a little bit of volume up on that part, but please enjoy Youth Produced Media Native. Hello, all my different kinds of relatives. Nun Danetsikwe Indigenikaz, Little Wind Woman, I'm called. Mikinok Nun Dindamen, Turtle is my clan. Tanawanda Ishkonaganing Nindunjaba, I'm from Tanawanda Reservation. I want to tell the story of long time ago, Mewija. The little animals and the big animals all had pride just like the humans, but they would go, I am so proud of my claws. Look at my powerful, powerful jaws. Look at my teeth or my long, fuzzy, beautiful tail. Look at my stripes and my strong, strong legs. So the Awensiag, the wild animals, they decided, how can we settle this question? How can we decide who is the best of all of us? Aha, we will have a great race. So one day, they gathered together in a council, and they got together and went to that starting line to do the race of all the animals. So in this race, we had Wagush the fox, Baneshi the bird, Makwa the the bear, and Waboos, the rabbit, and they started on their race. Well, Turtle, he didn't start off so fast. Slow and steady. Waboos was sitting there thinking, oh, this is just easy. Win a panud. I'll win no matter what. So Waboos got off to a slow start. He didn't even care when he saw his friends fall to the side tired and wore out from the race. So Wabus was just full of himself. He thought, this is no contest at all. I might as well take a little rest, show off to all those other ones. He decided he was going to stop and get himself food from the store. Well, here he got himself some modern foods, white flour and greasy hamburger and salt and foods that weren't traditional Wabus foods. Aha, Wabus. He was gonna eat that food and get all full. He asked, and as he ate and he ate, he filled himself up on the food. But this wasn't his traditional food. This wasn't rabbit food. He wasn't eating all those gifts from the Earth's garden. He was eating things from this world, of this modern world. This hamburger and these fries and these things that weren't designed for Wabus to eat. Pretty soon his stomach was full, but he wasn't eating his food, the food that was given to him to eat on this Earth. And he was all full. Oh, Nindayeko Skaikido Wabus. I'm tired. Niwi Nipa. Niwi Jingishin. I want to lay down. And he did. Pretty soon he dreamt. He dreamt he was out there and he was exercising, but he got bigger and bigger and bigger. And pretty soon. 
it could hardly do anything he wanted to do anymore because he had spent all of his time eating those things not meant for Wabuzug. Well, Mikinok wasn't that way. Mikinok kept going and kept walking in that race, slow and steady and sure. And when it was time to eat, Mikinok ate those good, ate those good foods that we've been given, those foods straight from the earth. Hi, I'm Dwayne. Hi, I'm Selena. And we're here with Dream of Wild Health. Dream of Wild Health is a program to help Native youths reclaim our health. We were once very healthy and due to little exercise and a poor diet, we now face many diseases and an unhealthy lifestyle. So what is the first step to a healthy lifestyle? Exercising for 30 minutes and eating healthy. So what are we doing today? Today we are making two nutritious smoothies. All right, so first thing you want to do is pour in two frozen mix, two cups of frozen mixed berries. So Selena, what did the strawberry say to that one? Um, I don't know. What did they say? If you weren't so sweet, we want to be in this jam. Mm -hmm. um, next, you want to add two cups of vanilla low-fat yogurt. What's your favorite kind of yogurt? Um, vanilla. Vanilla. I think we're putting vanilla in there, huh? Next, you add one cup of milk. And then you add one cup of orange juice. And when you have that all in, you blend it until it's nice and smooth. And when it came time to finish that race, slow but sure, there went Mekinok. Mekinok won that race. So just like us today, as we walk in this world, we need to think about those things that we were given as food, those foods that come right from Mother Earth that feed our spirits, our souls, our bodies, make us strong. And we need to look at those foods that are made from all sorts of things that never were placed here in the first place, but were made from people when they put them together in a different way. So to this end, we need to remember that as we're walking along, to remember our foods that were given to us, that they're here, they're still here, they're still here for us, and that this is the way we can go strong and bring our people with us. Miigwech, meio. Thank you so much for sharing that incredible, incredible film with us. And um, it's so fun to see the youth so engaged in finding those, you know, it incorporates the traditional stories, um, what we heard in the last panel, modern technology, storytelling, uh, to then making their own little smoothie and watching it spin around and around and around. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so thank you so much for sharing that with us. And um, I'm just going to go ahead and let all, you guys introduce yourselves. Um, and then I 
definitely want to start with you, Ernie. Um, somebody told me when I told them when I was coming here and I was moderating this panel, they're like, you have to just sit and listen to Ernie. So um, I'm really excited to spend some time and to hear um, about your family, the intergenerational learning, and the work that you guys are doing on the farm and with um, this incredible program. So if you guys want to go ahead and introduce yourselves to this okay. incredible crowd. Um, good Native American day, you know? It's a beautiful day today. And uh, that's how I start my day every day, by greeting the young people. Uh, telling them that it's a, a great Native Day today. Um, we, we have uh, programming at Dream of Wild Health. How many of you are familiar with Dream of Wild Health? Good, good. And uh, we work with young people, primarily with uh, the little ones from uh, 8 to 13 and the older kids from 14 to 17 years of age. We work, we're a 10 acre farm in uh, Hugo, Minnesota. But I'm gonna back up again because she introduced me. Uh, I should formally introduce myself, um, excuse me. Uh, my name is uh, Hinane. Um, I'm, um, my name is Date Bae, I'm Hinane, there we go. Um, Dave Bay is my given name, given to me by my great-grandfather, Charlie Whiteman, and uh, it means strong old man. And uh, my tribe is Hinane, uh, merely the people, but we're known as Northern Arapaho from Wind River. Um, I've been here in Minnesota for approximately 30-some years, and I've lived here. Um, I'm cultural director for Dream of Wild Health. Uh, I've been at Dream of Wild Health, Wild Health now about nine years, chasing ten years. Um, I got involved with Dream of Wild Health when uh, I was a teacher. I'm an artist and a teacher. And um, I was looking for a place where I could feel that uh, I could offer what I had. And uh, Dream of Wild Health was one of those programs that attracted me because it was working with youth. It was dealing with food. We all like to eat, right? <laughs> Anytime somebody says food, you know, we all perk up, you know, and <laughs> we want to be there. So I was interested in, in the, the program because it offered many things that, that are really important to our culture, you know, and to any Native culture, the food, uh, our language, uh, our culture, the art. Everything was incorporated into this farm. Uh, and so I became a part of this farm, and uh, it's a 10-acre farm. We raise organic food, but it, it led me on a path. Um, my family traditionally have been uh, people that have raised food. I grew up on a ranch in uh, Wyoming, the Arapaho Ranch, <clears throat> and uh, I grew up with... Uh, raising food. We had a garden, we had beef cattle, we had uh, horses. And so to me, food was something that I've always been involved in. And my family has a history of uh, being involved with food, not only eating it, but uh, growing it. And so when Dream of Wild Health, the opportunity came up, I was able to fully immerse myself into something that I felt was really, really uh, beneficial to our young people, uh, to our communities, and to our elders. And so by, by being part of the program, um, you begin to see what is important. What, what do we have to do? What is important for us as individuals, uh, the older people? Um, I was always taught that your role as an elder is to pass on that wisdom and knowledge to the young people. And if you don't, you're just an old person, you know? And I don't want to be just an old person. I would want to be a respected elder in knowing that I did what I was supposed to do in my lifetime. So this is the important thing that I feel that we do with our programming is to prepare our young people for the future. Um, we talk of the, uh, the, the family before was talking about the seeds, you know, which is very, very important, very important to everything that we do. And we grow, in, in our farm, we grow, uh, 
we grow seeds and leaders. And uh, those are two, two of the things that, that we, we do well, I think, on the farm, you know, because we have a lot of young people. They shut me off. <laughs> <laughs> they said, your time's up. <laughs> so it was just a reminder. So this is one of the, is it off again? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll just give you this. That. That's what they tried to give me to begin with, and I threw it away. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I always have it too close to my mouth like that, or I have it under here. <laughs> so um, this is one of, you know, to me, to me, um, healthy food, healthy diet is a very important part of our culture, uh, our native culture. You know, we, we've, always, we've always had healthy food. We've always ate healthy. We were the first organic farmers here. We were the first farmers of the continent. But what happened? What happened to us? We were removed from all that. Many of us were relocated to different places in the country. We weren't familiar with the land. We weren't familiar with, with uh, how to irrigate. So a lot of our people started to move away from that. Uh, you know, and the food was provided for us by the government, and it was terrible food. We all know that, you know. Uh, many of us are uh, uh, third, fourth generation of uh, commodities, you know. We, uh, we used to pride ourselves in who had the, had the most uh, cheese, the most commodities. I can remember that, you know. Yeah, whenever they'd say, line up for cheese, man, everybody would be in a straight line. You'd never see as many Indian people that straight, all in a line, you know, waiting for that gold. They called it gold when I was growing up. And so we, we started that diet. We started that diet. Um, and it was not a healthy diet. It was not healthy for any of us. And so what we tried to do is we tried to to decolonize our, our thinking process uh, about food, uh, even, even the way we teach our young people. We are decolonizing that whole process of a classroom type of situation, you know. We as Native people, we learn best outdoors, right? We all like to be outside. We all like to touch the plants, the grass, and that's the way, that's the way it should be, you know, when you're teaching young people um, the importance of their food. Um, we have uh, so much illnesses in our, in our uh, tribes today, you know, and that is solely the part of the foods causing that, you know. And so we need to get back toward the original foods of our people. Um, and by teaching the young people how to raise the food, how to cook the food, um, the spirituality around that food, you know, um, I, was so, I was so glad to hear about the music that they do, you know, all the rituals that we have. Our, our people are full of rituals, you know, and everything we do, we pray for everything, you know. Uh, I even pray at the casino sometimes, you know. <laughs> there, you really mean it, you know. Yeah. It's, not, it's not just a prayer then. So if you, hear, if you hear lightning and thunder this evening, you know I'm really praying hard, you know. So, but that's true, though. We, we pray. We pray a lot. And so we give thanks to everything we do. We don't just take. These are a lot of the components that we teach our young people, getting back to a lot of the basic teachings of our people, connecting with our culture, connecting with our food. Um, it's a circle. It's a circle that we all are involved in. Everything is connected in that circle, you know. Um, we have to know our food. We have to know it. Um, today, we're removed from it. We go to the grocery store, and we trust whoever puts that food out, we buy it. We don't know where it came from. We don't know what they put on it, but yet we buy it. So I, I feel very strongly about knowing where my food comes from, how it's grown. We've always had that connection to our food as people. And I think it's important that we get back to a lot of those basics of doing that again. So um, my family, uh, my daughter, uh, Missy, 
uh, has been involved with, with uh, the farm for many years, for as long as I've been there. Um, my grandson and my granddaughter are also involved in uh, the farm. So we have about three generations now that have been working with and part of Dream of Wild Health. So I'm gonna stop at this point um, because if I don't, then everybody else runs out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, so oh, your turn. Uh, how about those who say, um, my name, uh, my Indian name is uh, Wakbe Nibe, that means Red Bear Singing, but my English name is Lewis Whiteman, and I've been with the program for... for a long time, since I was like, <laughs> since I was like really little. But I've been doing like uh, the Chorus Kids program and the Garden Warriors program for like, a while, um, but yeah, it's a really good program. I introduced myself earlier. So he's been doing it, uh, he's been involved with the program since he was in high five and he's 14 now. So um, I'm not really good at math either, so. Um, um, yeah, the same here. Um, it's one of those things where it's a trickle down effect, I believe. Um, it really, I wanted to touch a little bit on, you know, our Grandma Molly, Great Grandma Molly and Great Grandpa Mike because they were um, healers and medicine people and connected to the land and our medicines. And because of spiritual prohibition, um, as well as boarding schools, um, they were, um, a lot of our ceremonies and our teachings in those ways of life were uh, take, uh, taken from us. But one of the things that um, we're always reminded of is that they're not taken or hidden or disappeared or lost. They're just removed for now. Um, they're hidden. They're somewhere else, you know, and they'll um, be recovered again. And I believe it's the seventh generation. A lot of us believe that, that, that are bringing those teachings back because they're our old ones. So with uh, boarding school era, you know, that affected our family. We have three generations that went to boarding school, and I just returned this morning from Carlisle, Pennsylvania with, uh, for the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition's conference. And uh, we re repatriated our relatives um, two summers ago. And that was something that is also part of that healing process as well as what we're, we're doing right now, what Dream of Wild Health does. And you know, we're living testimony to our ancestors that even though we may have gone to boarding school, you know, Grandma Eva went to boarding school, Grandpa John went to boarding school, they went to St. Stephen's, um, but yet, you know, Dad says that Grandma Eva is still gardened, and she was still connected to the land, and then Dad went to St. Stephen's, he went to boarding school, and then you look at where, you know, where we are now, where we're doing that healing work, and so the seventh generation, you know, can, can move forward quickly can advance quickly, especially in, in the food, indigenous food movement and way of life. So um, they brought me another one, so you guys get to share one. And um, so maybe uh, my first question to Lewis, if you just want to tell us a little bit about why you like being out on the farm and what you enjoy doing with your grandpa. Okay. Um, so a reason I really like the farm is because there's other native youth there and they're like interested in the same things you are, so eating healthy and connecting back to your roots. And then also you get to spend a lot of time with elders and like a lot of people don't get to do that. So, and I spend like a month out there with my grandpa. So we, um, I like working in tobacco with him and grow traditional tobacco. And some of the other boys from the program help too. So that's pretty fun. So what would be um, some of the challenges to Ernie and maybe Missy, um, some of the challenges of working and bringing the kids into, the youth into the program? Uh, for those kids that maybe are a little resistant to it or don't know what they're getting into, um, what are some of the ways that you really work to engage them into being part of the program? Well, I found that one of the greatest things that happens to young people is they don't listen to their parents, they listen to peers, right? Mm -hmm. They listen to peers. So um, other students that have been in our program uh, talk with other kids. 
they share with them about our program. They share with them what our program is about. Um, I used to do a lot of recruiting in schools uh, and trying to get students in our program, but now we, we, we have a reputation as being an organization uh, that's been around and is a very good organization, so parents um, want their children to be part of our program now. So we don't have to recruit the way we had to recruit at one time. I would go door to door and knock. Do you have any kids here? You know, <laughs> do you have any kids that want to be in my program? No, it wasn't that bad, but I would recruit. But now we have a waiting list. We have a waiting list of uh, students that want to be in our program. So that says something for the program. Uh, when you have a list of students that want to be part of your program, and I think that part of that is because we, we have earned that reputation as being around. We're coming to our 20th anniversary this summer. Isn't that something? Been around for 20 years. Thank you. Um, and we have such a wonderful staff. I think that's probably what helps to uh, bring students because we have a very reputable staff. We have people that have been with us for a while and uh, we have uh, just, I think, probably about 15 uh, employees now. Um, a lot of people would say that I, I'm, in a, I'm in a weird situation being there because uh, I work with all women. Can you imagine that? How many women that I've been working with for almost 10 years? I work with about 11, 12, 14 women now, you know? So I've learned to compromise. I've had to. <laughs> yes, you know? It will be done. But we, we, I, I work well with them, you know? And uh, traditionally, in, in the native culture, women were the ones that raised the food. Women did a lot of the food raising. Not saying the men didn't. Um, a lot of us like to play cards and stuff while the women are, are gardening, you know, and do our other hobbies. But uh, I'm just kidding, we don't do that. We raise tobacco. The men raise the tobacco on the farm. Um, the young men help me. It gives me the opportunity to, to teach them about the sacred tobacco and all the sacred plants that we have on the farm. So, sorry I took so long. No problem. Um, Missy, do you wanna? Making challenges, yeah, overcoming Overcoming some of the challenges. That's always a good question, because um, that's what life is about, right? Um, so um, for young people, um, I find um, I can always relate to like youth media training and um, engaging with young people. And there are always, there's always fear. I mean, that's just something that hu is human nature, is um, we have fear and we all react differently. And that's no different for young people. And I just think because they react differently than we do, um, it's not familiar to us. So we could see, we see it as resistance or we see it as rebellion. When in fact, maybe that young person is just afraid and they need reassurance. Um, and that's you know our job as adults to reassure them and just give them love. I mean, really, that's what it comes down to is if we're um, doing you know filmmaking or for creating. I mean, that's an act of creation, an act of um, honoring the creator. If we're planting food, if we're you know bringing new life into this world, you know we're also honoring creator. So we have to put love into that as well as our young people that we're teaching. And really, it's just it's just that approach of. Um, you know, advocating for them and standing next to them, beside them. So we have one of the questions here, and for everybody, again, just to mention, um, if you have any questions, I'll be going through them on pigeonhole. There was a question related to, um, does Dream of Wild Health work mainly in the with urban youth? And if you can discuss a little bit about that and how it might differ from the experiences of the family that was up here previously that is um, reservation-based. Well... Our, our program originally started in the urban environment. Um, Peter Wakan Tipi um, was started in St. Paul, uh, worked with transitional housing. And so the focus, I think, um, 
of the organization has, has been with uh, the urban native people. And so what we do, uh, because uh, we, we have a 10 acre farm outside of uh, Minneapolis in Hugo, Minnesota, um, we transport our youth to the farm every day during the summer. And uh, we, we work primarily with native youth from uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul. We have two pickup sites that we pick up our youth and we bring them back every day. So it would be a, a, a much different, I think, environment than um, a reservation environment in that um, we are transporting our children out to the country, you know, whereas on a reservation, they're already out in the country. And many of the kids that, that live in urban environments have never, never had that experience of actually being outside and being close to nature and working with food, learning about your culture. And so I think it's a benefit for us to be in the country, to bring the kids out to the country, rather than uh, coming to the city to teach the kids. Thank you. Um, any comments from either one of you guys? Any comments? Mm -hmm. um, so reference to uh, Native youth. Um, Minneapolis here, we have uh, one of the largest concentrations of um, Native um, people and also we have Little Earth housing projects, and that's something that um, is unique here in the cities. Um, the thing is, is like we grew up in the city too. I grew up and I can remember being afraid of bugs. <laughs> <laughs> and now, you know, we live near Mille Lacs now, so it's, that's a little different. But um, just with native kids living in the city, there's always this balance between our traditional way of life and being city, you know, especially if you're living in, you know, South Minneapolis, you have, um, you know, gang influence, you have a lot of other um, more negative, I don't want to say negative, but just more challenges that you have to face. And then in the meantime, like finding that balance with who you are as an indigenous person, young person living in the city. And I think the kid, the, the young people who are garden warriors really exemplify um, having that balance. Yeah, it's so important for us to consider those living in urban settings. And I say that as the director of the Urban Indian Health Institute um, and also as an urban Indian myself and the connection and the ability to have programs that connect our people. And I always think about myself as a visitor to the land of the Coast Salish people in Seattle where I live. And so I acknowledge that they are the first peoples. And um, I think it's important for us to engage our youth that yes, we are visitors on other people's land and we also have land of our own. And I know I always feel like when I step back into Alaska and there's this creek that I put my feet in, it, I can feel that it knows who I am. And the more that we can engage with our urban Indian youth too and recognize that 75, about 71% of our people are living in urban areas, that we are Indian people regardless of where we live. It has, urban is in very small letters, Indian is in the biggest letters. Um, that is who we are, and the more that we can recognize that. So thank you so much for having that as part of your perspective. Um, I wanted to ask another question to Lewis, and more about, like, what are some of the things that are grown on the farm? Um, what kind of, that was one of the questions coming from Pigeonhole, what kind of um, things are grown on the farm? Um, there's, um, I got some big patty pans, they're, like, <laughs> big, and there's, um, There's squash. There's oh, we have the three sisters. We have squash, beans, and corn, and we have a youth garden that is um, um, it's like planted by the youth and maintained by the youth. But then there's well, there's squash. There's kale. There's like romaine kale, dino kale, and there's um, there there. I think there's melons there. Yeah, there is, and then there's also. I already said beans. Um, it's just a it's a wide variety of things. Um, huh? Oh yeah, there's like wild choke cherries and plums and stuff, and we pick those and harvest them. And we made the uh, choke cherry 
um, syrup one year. We did that this year too. Um, and we harvested the plums with um, Hope, one of the other elders there, and that was really fun and a good learning experience. So um, a question for you, Missy, is um, as thinking about this and you know having this intergenerational learning between your father and your son and yourself, um, what, is, what is one of the most important things to you when it comes to ensuring that passing of traditional knowledge? Uh, right now, I feel like I'm the bridge between these two and the relationship that they have. Um, like I see uh, my dad's legacy in Lewis. Like I see, like I look at my dad and he tells me stories about him growing up and he's like, would get in trouble and I'm like, oh. And I look at Lewis and I say, oh, that's where he, get it. he gets it from. <laughs> um, but the insurance of that is that to make sure, you know, like um, the family before us, they said they're really lucky because they have three generations you know, that, that are together. And not a lot of families these days, you know, have that be, because we, we are, you know, we come from blended families or we, I don't like to, I don't want to say broken, but we, we recreate our families. Um, and we have sometimes parents that are missing. And, you know, for our family, uh, Lewis's dad hasn't always been in his life, but, you know, the one male that's been in his life is his grandpa. And to make sure as, you know, someone who's in between their generations to make sure that he hangs out with his grandpa and they spend time together. And, you know, Dream of Wild Health really gives that opportunity. And the fact that there are actually two elders, not, there's not just dad, but there's also Hope Flanagan. We keep referring to Hope Flanagan. Um, she's an amazing, um, knowledgeable person of plant medicine and our plant relatives. You could say, hey, Hope, what's this? And what, it's for? what is it for? And she'll tell you. Or if you ask her, you know, hey, Hope, um, you know, I have an ouchie. What do I use it for? And she's like, plantain. And then she'll teach you how to put that, you know, on yourself and how to heal yourself. So, you know, our generation, like, in between, like, that's our responsibility to make those connections because not all youth, not all young people know how to approach our elders. They don't know about offering tobacco. They don't know protocol. Or they just might be scared. So, like, that's our, our responsibilities. Well, we have about 10 minutes left. Sorry, the clock is off by five minutes. It started a little bit late. And I'm going to ask our next panelist to go to the back to the sound booth to get mics if you haven't done that already. Um, but I have one more question, again, from, the, from um, some of the audience members that um, hopefully um, each of you wouldn't mind answering. And even was originally directed at Lewis, but I'll actually I'll start with you, Lewis. Um, what do you, and, and to think about this, what do you learn at the farm than, that is different than what you learn from school? How is it different? And maybe um, if, if each of you guys can touch on why that's, what is different and what is important about that? Um, I learned, like, you learn how to interact with other people and your elders, and you learn more about yourself as a Native person and who you are and where you come from and, like, what your responsibilities are. And it's not, you, it's not, um, it's not like you sit there and you take notes and you look at the teachers. Um, it's more of like, if you want to listen, you can listen and learn. So yeah. So as Lewis's mom, <laughs> and uh, what I see the difference in him um, is that you know I think at school um, because he he once went to a school that that uh, was a farm school. And they have uh, Monsanto. They have a lot of Monsanto uh, farming. And it's on here. It's Piers, uh, Minnesota. Small German Catholic town. There's a big uh, church in, in the center of town. And one of the things that um, he's learned at school is there's, there are young people who have um, cancer and who have ticks and have um, certain um, physical Oh, deformities, he said. So he, because of the ed education that he had at Dream of Wild Health, he knows that connection to GMOs. He knows that connection to Monsanto. He knows that, you know, the school is funded by Monsanto. He knows that the farmers that live around us, that they, ha when they have a sign up that says, you know, this company or that company, that they're all linked to Bayer. And he can tell his friends if he chooses, you know, what, what that is. 
And even, you know, now he goes to Onamia, which um, has a population of 53% native youth to 47%. And so now I feel like he's in an environment where he can actually teach his friends openly about indigenous food knowledge, if he chooses. What was the question again? <laughs> what is important about the learning on the farm versus what kids are being taught in, in schools? Oh, I think there's a lot. How much time do we have? <laughs> no, um, I, I think that, you know, um, as I mentioned earlier about the style of teaching and the placement of where we are is very important part of why it is different, you know. Um, Native people are people of the earth. We are earth people. And so for us to be in an outdoor environment is natural. We're not meant to be in this building. We're not meant to be in this dark room without windows. How can you learn in this kind of a space? You know, um, we need to touch things. We need to feel the plants. And I feel that's the important part <laughs> of Dream of Wild Health is that we are an outdoor environmental place of learning. And for us to be there is only natural. So it's much different than being in a classroom situation, you know. Um, even the structure of uh, how, we, how we place ourselves when we sit, we sit in a circle. We don't have this hierarchy like we have here today. We are here at the top. You are over there. Mm -hmm. See, that's that, that colonial mentality that we have to separate. We use the circle is what we do. We utilize the circle and the importance of that circle in our lives. Thank you so much. And let's give this incredible family a round of applause. <laughs> So thank you so much. We appreciate your time, your stories, your knowledge. And um, for everybody out there, if you have any questions for them, uh, they're going to be here. Definitely reach out. And I'm going to ask that the next panelists start coming up, and I'll do some door prizes. Um, and we'll switch over to our next panel. We're going to add some chairs, too. So thank you. Thank you.